I, I need to ask you about the cover, Rose, first, because you, you actually have your hair being shaved off on the cover. Why is that? It's just a symbol of freedom, and I wanted a really arresting book cover and one that, you know, if I was writing a think piece, I didn't really think people needed to see my smiling face on it. And I think there's just something so powerful about a woman no longer wanting hair. And, and I know that in the book, you, which by the way is a brilliant read and it's written in such a powerful way, all of it from start to finish, you, you uh, talk about how as soon as you engage with Hollywood, they want you to be a certain way and hair is part of that. Hair is very much part of that. I opened the book with a story about, you know, when I had short hair growing up, when I was told directly that I had to have long hair, the men, otherwise the men in Hollywood wouldn't want to sleep with me. If they didn't want to sleep with me, then they wouldn't hire me. And this was told to me by a female agent, and I was very young, and so I grew my hair out. Now, hair is a very beautiful thing, but just make sure it's your choice whether you want to have it or not. Tell us about your childhood, which you mentioned, because it was Italy, and you were in a cult. I was. Uh, I find a lot of people are in cults without them usually knowing it, but I knew it. Uh, I was in a group called Children of God, and that's part of what my book is. It's an autobiography, but I also compare the cult that I grew up in to the cult of Hollywood and how it affects your mind in ways you're not aware of. And the, the, the Children of God cult involved you sometimes being hurt. You were, you were slashed with razors and stuff. Uh, that was for an imperfection. Um, they wanted you to be perfect and also, but it also had, it was very interesting. There were positives and negatives, like in most things. And the positive side was that we read a lot and that it really emphasized the mind and learning. And the negative side is that it was something that devolved into a power mad, you know, man's idea of what paradise is, which doesn't usually bode well for women and children. And as I'm reading about you in this cult and you're just a, a little girl at the time and thinking that this is terrible and I want to sympathize. And then you suddenly turn it on the reader and you say, if, if you're reading this, you're in a cult too, because we are all being fed by Hollywood. Is that right? Yes. And programmed by a general overall like societal machine. And the things that I was told are things that everybody else gets told. I was just told them in the most bald-faced way you could be told them, whereas other people kind of like look at themselves and think, well, maybe I should be doing this or that because I see it all around me. But you have to ask, why are you seeing it around you? And if you're in a structure that you're supporting that's not benefiting you, then usually you are, in fact, in a cult. The, the linchpin moment is your encounter with Harvey Weinstein. Can you tell us about that? That's not really something I usually talk about. In the, in the book, it's very much part of just what was done to me by the complicity machine in Hollywood and how it took a very sweet young girl and destroyed a big part of her that I then had to learn how to survive because sexual assault, what it does to us is it's a form of murder, I believe. You, you, you uh, I'll fill in a few of the gaps for, for people watching, but you essentially got into the situation a lot of other stars got into where you're taken to his hotel room thinking it's about business and he attacks you. And obviously, now what's fascinating is that the trauma of that, you say you're almost locked in it for years afterwards, but unable to understand that he is utterly to blame. Oh, I understood that he was to blame. A lot of people that are hurt, and there are so many of us that have been hurt, so many of us don't understand that they are not to blame. But you were in this environment where he was still the big cheese, as they say. Completely. He was the cult leader. And you, you would say, yeah, the cult leader, exactly. So you would say to people, this happened to me. And then they would say things like, what? Oh, he does that to everyone. Things like that, yes. And what did you think about that? I didn't think much of those people, nor do I think much of them now. Did you begin to then fall out of love with Hollywood or were you already out of love with it? I was never really in love with Hollywood. For me, it was my day job. I'm an artist in full and I've always been a writer and uh, now a filmmaker and I'm producing and singing on an album that I've been creating for the past three years as well. While for the past four years, really pushing against Hollywood and pushing at societal constructs and pushing back at um, the rules that we're all meant to follow, what are they going to do? Put you in timeout celebrity jail? If you, you know what I mean? I mean, it's absurd. <laughs> well, in a way, you've put yourself there because you've, I gather, just completely sold your house in Hollywood and you, you don't have an address now. Is that right? I do not have an address. Okay. No. You, we should say you're here to get, this is really remarkable, the GQ Inspiration of the Year Award, which is always to a bloke, is going to Rose this year. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And, and that's your, and the, the editor of GQ, D Dylan Jones, says it's for your sheer strength and bravery in being the first to publicly accuse an industry figurehead of grossly abusing his position of power. So tell us about the moment when you came to the point of actually directing publicly at Weinstein the blame for what he'd done. Uh, it wasn't, I worked with the New York Times and NBC News in the beginning before NBC faltered on getting the story out. It wasn't, I'd been, uh, it took me about three years to write Brave, and in the last year of it, um, before the story broke in the New York Times about the assaults, um, I was working on it with those journalists for about eight months beforehand. So and that was the key article, while. yeah. That was the key article. Is it now, is, is, are the wheels coming off some of it now where we hear accusers, um, not you but others, now being blamed for things that they've done, the court case against Weinstein, they're throwing everything against his accusers. What do you make of that? Well, I make of it that life has twists and turns and that it just shows that it doesn't matter who you are, you can potentially be hurt too. So Asia Argento, who's one of the main accusers now being accused of doing something herself to a younger person, a mm -hmm. young, essentially boy. It's an ugly narrative. And I, my heart, you know, hurts for everybody involved in the situation, but most especially for the alleged victim who you know, for his path that he's on. And Me Too will survive that, do you think, or not? Listen, Me Too is a conversation. Me Too is about all of us growing up and having an adult conversation that needed to be had a long time ago because people are dying. Why do you say that? Because people get killed and die of rape every day. And people, it starts with sexual harassment and it works its way up and it's insidious. And if so many of us in the society are walking around this damage, then you've got a pretty messed up society, don't you? Do, you? do you believe people have to be brave to get through this? I believe that we are brave and that it gets told and we get told at a young age that we're not. And I think we have to remember that we're free creatures and sovereign beings who are here to experience a really big life, one that doesn't involve hurt and pain as much as we can possibly help it. And if we can all treat each other as the great humans that we are, then maybe we'd have something.